not scared of libel suits. This is the first in a series of several tapings which will extend over several months and several hours with President Nixon. In the subsequent sessions, we'll talk about some of the uh, domestic and foreign leaders that he's known and get his insights into their lives and careers. Uh, in this first session, uh, we will begin uh, at the beginning with uh, his early life and political career. Uh, to begin at the beginning, uh, do you have a first uh, conscious memory? Well, curiously enough, uh, my first memory is of running. Uh, I recall when I was about three or three and a half years of age that uh, my mother was driving a horse and buggy, a very fast horse. Uh, she was carrying my younger brother, who was then one, Don, on her lap, uh, and uh, a neighbor girl who was about 12 was holding me. Uh, the buggy turned a, a corner and the horse took off and the neighbor girl dropped me. I fell out of the buggy. I got a crease in my scalp and I jumped up afterwards and I was running, running, trying to catch up because I was afraid to be left behind. Hmm. Uh, incidentally, uh, I had uh, a wound from that for many years thereafter. I wasn't able to part my hair on the left due to the fact that I had about 15 stitches down that scalp. Didn't you in the 1946 campaign, didn't you, uh, weren't you going to mention that in a, in a biography and didn't uh, your press secretary suggest that you not? Oh yes, the suggestion was made that, oh, you can't tell them that you got hit in the head by a, uh, a carriage or wheel because they'll think that that's why there's something wrong with your head. And so uh, I haven't told that story too often lately. <laughs> Didn't uh, actually that did work against uh, Wayne Morris, didn't it? Uh, the yes, Joe McCarthy. Uh, in I thought w one of his uh, attacks that I thought was uh, out of line. They weren't all out of line, but this one certainly was. He said the trouble with Wayne Morris is that he got kicked in the head by a horse sometime, <laughs> and that uh, that was why he was a little nutty. Your uh, in your memoirs, you wrote about your parents that uh, whoever said that mm -hmm. opposites attract. Uh, was describing the two of them. We have some uh, photographs of your mother here. The first one, I think, was taken as a girl in Indiana. And uh, the next one is a group uh, portrait, very characteristic of the times, in, uh, taken in Whittier when she was a teenager. And uh, the last one, I think, is also uh, of her at that same time. It's remarkable how much she looks like Julie, I think, in these pictures. Yes, she does. Do, uh, what do you think of, uh, what characteristics do you think of uh, when you think of your mother in that period, in the early years? Well, I have said that uh, she was quite a remarkable woman. Uh, and I guess most of us uh, say that about our mothers uh, and really feel it. And each of them is, each in a different way. Uh, but I think in her case, uh, those characteristics that stand out among many are uh, first, uh, great strength, uh, great kindness. Uh, she had a soft manner about her in her speech and the way she acted. I've never recalled a time when she raised her voice in anger about anything, but she could be very, very convincing uh, in speaking very, very softly about something with which she disapproved. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, she had a great capacity for love, uh, which extended far beyond her, her husband, whom she loved dearly, her children, 
for whom she would do anything. She, that capacity for love seemed to emanate to everybody, to her sisters, to those she cared for when my brother was sick. Uh, and all of this uh, uh, made her develop characteristics that some friends used to say, they used to tell me, you know, Hannah, which was her name, is a Quaker saint. Did, uh, I think you wrote somewhere that uh, were she alive today that she wouldn't uh, support the strong law and order ethic that uh, underlies a lot of contemporary politics. Uh, she had too much compassion to do that, that's true. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recall an incident uh, at the time that we had the grocery store and uh, we were working there and uh, one of our customers uh, whose children uh, were good friends of mine in school and of Don's, my brother's, uh, she found had been shoplifting. And uh, under the circumstances, uh, the sheriff came by and we me she mentioned it to him and he said, well, you'll have to report this. And she says, I won't do it because uh, it will be terrible for her and for her children. So one day, uh, when the lady came in and what she picked up, incidentally, was so small, it was just a kleptomaniac problem because they weren't poor, not by the standards of those days. She had a pound of butter and uh, a little uh, and, uh, and some eggs and some cheese. And uh, she had slipped it into the bag and she took it out and had it checked it through. My mother followed her out to the car and she said, uh, I wonder if you would like to pay me for those things. Uh, the woman burst into tears and said, please don't tell my husband he would kill me and that we're ruined with the boys. And my mother said, don't be concerned. She says, how much do you think you've taken? And the woman estimated about $75 worth. She says, I'll pay you back. And for the next year, she paid her back at $5 a month uh, until it was all paid. The boys never heard about it. Her husband didn't hear about it. And of course, she didn't continue to come in the store. Uh, but that was the way my mother would do it. She, she would never enforce the law if some other way uh, you could work the thing out. Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, so the restriction on cable, just for a second. Keep rolling tape. There you go. On cable. So we're going to check that one last Does that look? How does that look? Start that, please. And start at the real hole. That's good. That's good. Thank That's you. good. You just go just there. Okay, Frank. And uh, we'll come out to camera two and keep on like that. Is that all right? <coughs> Your mother was a very community minded woman, but she was also an intensely private woman, even, I think, in her praying. Oh, she certainly was. Uh, she never believed in uh, wearing religion on her sleeve. Uh, we went to church a great deal, I must say, and she insisted on that, as did my father. Uh, I recall, for example, we used to go to Sunday school and church uh, in the morning on Sunday and Christian Endeavor at church in the evening and then even go to prayer meeting sometimes on the middle of the week. Uh, but on the other hand, when it came to praying, first we always had silent grace at table, except on occasion she would have each of the boys uh, repeat a verse uh, so that she could be sure that we were learning our verses. And when she prayed, she would often go, as the Bible indicates you should, uh, into the closet and close the door. Uh, she never prayed publicly. Your father, many of the people who remember him, uh, think of uh, his most prominent characteristic as his temper. Uh, and I gather that even in the store, you had to sort of insulate him from the customers. Yeah. Well, he was argumentative, he was combative, he was competitive. 
uh, he, he was a character, there's no question about that. Uh, the very opposite of my mother in that respect. Uh, and uh, she often had to soothe ruffled uh, feathers of customers who came in because my father would pick arguments with them. He loved to talk about politics or anything for that matter. Uh, and uh, she'd sometimes, uh, when people would come into the store that he was having a running argument with, uh, one or the others of us would rush up to wait on that customer to sure my dad didn't get to him. Uh, and that's the way we handled him. But on the other hand, uh, I don't get the wrong impression about him as a real man. Uh, he too was remarkable in his way. You know, he, my mother understood him. My mother had, was, was quite well educated for those times. She was proficient in Greek and in Latin and in German. Uh, she also uh, knew something about the piano, helped me a bit when, in that respect. Uh, she'd been to college for two years and then got married before finishing. My father uh, only went through the sixth grade. We have a photograph here of him taken, I think, shortly after he moved to Whittier. He'd had a lot of uh, interesting jobs before that, hadn't he? Well, as a matter of fact, he went only to the sixth grade, not because he was dumb, but because his mother died of tuberculosis uh, when he was about uh, eight or nine years old. And from then on, he was shunted from family to family, and he worked in every kind of a job. He worked as a streetcar motorman in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he worked in the wheat fields in Colorado. Uh, he worked in the oil fields. Uh, he was an excellent carpenter. As a matter of fact, he built the house that I was born in. Uh, he was the greatest fireplace maker that Yorba Linda or anybody ever had. He used to make fireplaces for all the people when they were building fireplaces in their houses. Uh, and then, of course, he uh, was one who was always ahead of the times. He bought the first tractor in Yorba Linda. And then he contracted out to all the others to do work with tractors when others were still using horses. Uh, he uh, was one who uh, bought the first, built the first service station and store between Whittier and La Habra when people, uh, other people didn't see that this was a real uh, moneymaker. Uh, so as I say, I, we, I, I think that uh, the boys, all of us, inherited from our mother, uh, certainly, uh, uh, some of her fine characteristics, but we also inherited uh, from our father some of his characteristics. In my case, uh, I guess I'd have to credit him with the competitive spirit, with the combativeness, uh, et cetera. Didn't he uh, believe strongly uh, in work, the importance of work above all else, even to the exclusion of uh, labor-saving devices? Oh, yes. Oh, he, you can say that again. Uh, not only did he believe in work, but uh, he had worked all his life himself. Uh, that didn't mean that he didn't have concern about people that couldn't get a job. Uh, you know, his bark was much... Uh, louder than his bite. Uh, and uh, while the tramps would come along as they did in those days, particularly of the Depression, my mother always fed him. He always insisted they do a little work. Uh, and uh, his feeling was that uh, if uh, you worked hard, you could get a job and you could keep it. Uh, and uh, as far as labor-saving devices were concerned, you see in the, those years of the Depression, uh, we weren't too aware of it, of course, but I can remember very well he said the way to get more jobs is not to have all these machines to dig ditches. Get people out there to dig those ditches. That's the way to have jobs. Mm -hmm. So he, was, he would have done very well in India, <laughs> where they also opposed labor-saving devices. Did they have uh, discussions at, uh, later on about moving back to Pennsylvania, where I think you, your mother had fond memories of a farm, and he had very realistic... Uh, oh, they, they had discussions not only of moving to Pennsylvania, but just of going to a farm, Johnny. My, my mother had the most pleasant, almost mystical memories of her growing up on a farm in Indiana. And uh, she remembered all the nice things about it, uh, uh, the harvest time, and the springtime, and the snow, and so forth. And she used to talk about it, and dream about it, and so forth. Uh, because she was 12 years old before she left Indiana. And so she used to say to my dad, says, we got to go to a farm. And I remember one time we drove clear up to Oregon looking for a farm. Uh, it wasn't just Pennsylvania. That's where they eventually bought one after I came to Washington. Uh, but she wanted to go to a farm. And my, my dad used to say, Hannah, forget it. He says, I've been on a farm. I know what it is. And then he would describe the hard work of a farm, the backbreaking work. Uh, uh, having to shovel manure, uh, take care of the horses, et cetera, et cetera, uh, having to 
uh, run the risk, of course, of bad weather destroying a crop, uh, you know, scratching and biting around. He says, I don't want any part of a farm. Mm -hmm. But eventually, of course, she won, as she usually did. They did go to a farm, uh, just as she won on the matter of religion. You know, my mother was a Quaker, as I think we, I've, everybody is quite aware. I referred to her as a Quaker saint. And my father was a Methodist, and, uh, but when they married, they compromised. Uh, they both became Quakers, of course. When they, uh, when they went to the farm, didn't he, didn't he uh, disconcert uh, visitors by the way he named some of the animals? Well, yes. Uh, he would name the animals for certain political people that he didn't like. And uh, under the circumstances, some of them didn't particularly appreciate that. Uh, I think one was named for Truman, another one for Stassen, and people like that, as I recall. This is a, uh, we have a photograph here of the house that he built that you were born in. Uh, I think it, at one point in the 1950 campaign, you went back there and, and uh, commented about how small, coming back to it, how small it seemed to you after not having been there for a while. What are your memories of early life in that it, house? <clears throat> it didn't seem small then. Uh, I remember particularly Christmas time. I remember you see the fireplace there, which the old man built, and it was a marvelous fireplace, threw out a lot of heat. And uh, I remember, of course, we believed in Santa Claus, uh, and I remember coming down those stairs. Uh, we used to sleep upstairs. My mother and father's room was over on this side of the house, uh, the bedroom in which I was born, as I was born in that house. And uh, the uh, but we'd come down and we'd sit around the fireplace and it seemed like it was a very big room and a very nice room. I guess what I remember most about that house though was uh, talking. There was no television then. There was no radio. But did we talk? Evening after evening. And uh, that's uh, one of the reasons, for example, that I think I uh, got an interest in politics very, very early. Because I can even remember my, my father berating my mother for having voted for Woodrow Wilson in 1916. Now, this was much later, about 1920, 21, when he then was saying, now, look, you vote the straight Republican ticket. And yet in 1924, I remember very well that he didn't vote the straight Republican ticket. He voted for La Follette uh, because La, he thought La Follette was against the trusts. La Follette was against big business. Uh, La Follette was for the little man. and. Uh, he thought that uh, Coolidge was too much for the big man. And so he was, uh, he was, it was all of his talk of voting the straight party line. Uh, he was very independent in his own, his own way. Given that, uh, that opposites do attract, what do you think it was that your mother saw in your father? They met, I think, at a Valentine's dance uh, and uh, within three months were married, and yet uh, the differences must have been tremendous at the time. She came from a, a very refined, restrained, uh, rooted Quaker family, and he was sort of a freewheeling, rambling kind of... Diamond uh, in the rough. Yeah. Right. I think she saw in him, first, that uh, he was a very handsome fellow, uh, vigorous, handsome. Uh, he had a lot of magnetism, uh, and I think that emanated. That affected her to an extent. And I think another thing that affected her was... Uh, the fact that uh, she felt that, uh, that he really needed her. I mean, she, my mother had such a heart, you know, and, and I think when she realized that this boy uh, hadn't had a mother, and incidentally, he hated his stepmother, even though she, and incidentally, she lived right near us, in, there in Yor near Yorba Linda, but he didn't like her at all, uh, and he had never really had much of a chance in life. Why and he you? wanted desperately, I remember my father always said to each of us, uh, you got to go on to school. He says, I didn't finish. You got to, and he insisted we go on. He Why wanted us to have a better time than he had. Why didn't he like his stepmother? I think it's because uh, stepmothers are stepmothers. Uh, she was somewhat of a disciplinarian. Uh, I knew her. Her, her. She was married, as a matter of fact, to uh, Doc Marshburn, who was the father of Oscar Marshburn, who married my mother's youngest sister. And uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, coincidence. Uh, I met her, I knew her, I liked her, uh, but uh, she was a very strong personality. Uh, and I just think that my father, uh, just uh, he, he was probably independent, it probably as much fault his as hers. Was it difficult growing up around a man with a, uh, with a voluble temper? Uh, to an extent, yes, but, uh, and if it had not been for my mother, it would have been very difficult. Uh, but insofar as his temper was concerned, I, I should make it clear that he was not a violent man. 
I remember, for example, uh, to show you what a soft touch he was, uh, we used to love to go barefoot. And in the winter, of course, we couldn't do that. Uh, but just as soon as spring came, uh, we would go to my mother and say, can we go barefoot now? Because we, in, sh in school, you wore shoes if you had them, which we did. Uh, and she'd say, go ask your father. And he'd say, go ask your mother. But finally, it was always the old man that gave in. He said, okay, go barefoot. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he, uh, he, why well, you're not supposed to, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, spot, you, they say don't, uh, uh, you, you uh, fail to use the rod, you spoil the child. Uh, uh, but he was not one who uh, could uh, use that uh, physical punishment as much as others did. Mm. And I can't recall it too much. We have some uh, early family photographs of uh, you in a chair and uh, some other ones with... Uh, uh, didn't your father cut your hair? That's a very... Uh, oh, yes, and boy, we hated <laughs> the bowl, that. The bowl yeah. look brings that yeah, My father, mind. you know, as I said, he could do it all. <laughs> and he was the barber, too. Uh, and he not only cut our hair uh, of all uh, when we were growing up, uh, but uh, he... Uh, insisted on continuing to do it even after there was a barber in town. And I remember, I think I got my first what we call store haircut when I was about eight, nine years old. And I was glad to have it because I, I remember sometimes my father had clippers that sometimes they pulled and getting a haircut was agony and I just hated to do it. Uh, but he was a good barber. It was a pretty good job he did, I thought, when I looked at those pictures. We have a couple of other ones, I think. You had... Uh there is a, a young Nixon amidst the pumpkins. I think that's you below and Harold up above. That's exactly who it is, yes. I, have, I don't think I've seen that picture before. Now the, the, yeah. the psychologists would say that the, the, the pumpkin papers were prefigured in this photograph. Oh yes, they'd figure some way to, uh, the psychohistorians would figure that, that's, uh, that that had to have something to do with Whitaker Chambers hiding the microfilm in pumpkins, in pumpkins. Uh, 40 years later. And this is, uh, you and uh, I guess that's Arthur on your mother's Don. lap there. That's Don. Don. Don, and I'm there three and a half. He, Don was two years younger than I. That's right. They, she named, except for Don, who was named after your father, Francis mm -hmm. Donald, didn't she name you? Uh, she had historical. Well, always that, yeah. She had an historical sense, and uh, we were all named uh, after the, uh, the early kings of England, of course. Harold, obviously, uh, Richard, uh, Edward, and Arthur. Um, it was a, uh, uh, a remarkable family. I think Jessamine West has, uh, has written about some of the early uh, mill houses in uh, The Friendly Persuasion. This is a photograph of your great-grandmother Elizabeth Millhouse. Which, who is also Jessamine West's great-grandmother. Ah. They're the same. And wasn't she the she model? She cousins. And, that, and as a matter of fact, she was the model uh, for, the, for the mother in Friendly Persuasion, playing opposite... Uh, Gary Cooper, you know, in that marvelous movie, which incidentally was uh, Mamie Eisenhower's favorite movie. She saw it, she told me, a half a dozen times. Wasn't Elizabeth Milhouse was a, a Quaker preacher? Remarkably uh, capable, apparently, and very famous. Uh, she was a preacher in the Indiana, Iowa area. Uh, now, by a Quaker preacher, I should say that uh, uh, the Quakers uh, didn't have preachers in the real sense, but she, would, uh, she was one that had the spirit, uh, as the Quakers would say it. She was moved by the spirit, and she would go from place to place to Quaker meeting, uh, and uh, she would speak, and she was in much demand. Uh, I think one of the favorite family stories, and this is not apocryphal because I've heard it from all the people who knew her, and I knew her too, because uh, she lived to be 94, and I knew her. Uh, uh, and, of course, admired her, too. Anyway, she was uh, uh, scheduled to go on a long train trip in order to do a, a meeting in another city. Uh, and because in those days the food on the train was expensive and this and that and the other thing, uh, she made some sardine sandwiches up, and she put them in her cape, uh, one of these long capes that she, and she rode on the train, and she got very busy preparing her remarks uh, for when she got to the meeting, uh, that uh, she didn't get to eat the uh, sardine sandwiches. So she went into the, right in time to 
uh, to give her sermon, and her theme that day uh, was the parable of the loaves and the fishes. And she was very apparently expressive in her gestures. And when she came to the loaves and the fishes, she had had her hands in her cape. She threw out her hands, and out came the sardines uh, and the sang over the early over the people right in the front row. So it was a very graphic illustration. Before the, I guess some of these modern television preachers would love to have had that one. And incidentally, her eyesight was amazing. Uh, my dad used to have his socks; they get holes in them. And she insisted that she wanted to darn the socks, and she uh, could do it. She didn't have to wear glasses to do so. This uh, is a photograph of your grandmother, Milhouse, who had a very uh, important effect on yes. your life. And uh, you see, the, the great grandmother was on my my grandfather's side. Uh, this is on my uh, grandmother's side. Uh, what I would say, uh, and uh, Almira was her name. Uh, everybody called her Aunt Allie. And uh, she, too, lived to be very old, 93, 94. Uh, I have many vivid memories of her. She, she was a poet, uh, not a great poet, but she used to write me and my brothers and all of her children and so forth on birthdays, often in rhyme. And uh, she, uh, she took a special interest in me. I don't know why, uh, but, uh, but she did. And I recall she'd always give me very special presents when I graduated. Uh, one, for example, I recall when I graduated from the eighth grade, uh, she gave me a picture of Lincoln, and beneath it was uh, the famous Longfellow poem, Lives of great men oft remind us we can make our life that kind, and departing leave behind us footprints in the sand of time. Uh, incidentally, I took off from that because I was the, uh, the president of the eighth grade graduating class, and so I gave the class history. I wrote the class history in poetry myself, and I concluded it with these lines, lives of great men oft remind us we can make our life that sort, and departing leave behind us footprints on the tennis court. Well, some of them didn't appreciate it, but I thought it was a pretty good line. In any event, my, my grandmother then, when I graduated from high school, gave me a biography of Gandhi. Of course, she being a Quaker, uh, that meant a great deal to, to her and to me, and I read it from cover to cover several times. I graduated from college. She gave me a leather-bound Bible. And when I graduated from law school, she gave me a marvelous illustrated Life of Christ, uh, which Billy Graham says is one of the great classics. Uh, but more than that, I think what she meant to me was the fact that, that her, her manner and everything, oh, I perhaps... Uh, uh, should mention that it wasn't just me, but she was equally good and generous to all of the, her children. You have to understand, she was the mother of seven herself, and there were two others. I mean, she was a mother of six, and there were two, uh, two others. And uh, in addition to that, there were all kinds of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and all were treated equally. Uh, and I remember Christmas time, she would be there, uh, we'd always have what we called a family reunion. And uh, incidentally, the old man didn't like to go to those reunions, you know. He was uh, pretty cantankerous about it, but he loved my grandmother, and she liked him because she understood him just like my mother did. And at Christmas, she would sit there in a lovely velvet dress, I remember, around the Christmas tree, and all of us, she gave incidentally to us on Christmas, every Christmas, five dollars. Five dollars in little envelopes that were on the tree, and of course that was a fortune in those days. But anyway, she'd sit there, and we had presents for her. They were nothing things, but she'd make over those presents as if it's just what I wanted. Another thing that was interesting about her, you know, my grandmother always addressed us with what we call the we Quakers call the plain speech. She she wouldn't say, "Are you going?" She says, "Richard is thee going, and is this thine?" She did that with everybody she met, including people that were strangers. And then in the next generation, my mother, it, with her sisters, always broke into the plain speech whenever they were talking on telephone. It was always very interesting to me to hear them say, she'd say, is Martha or Jane or whatever sister we might be calling, I just thought that this thing of thine was very good and so forth and so on. And then we got down to our generation and we didn't use it at all. My mother, for example, never used the plain speech with her children she did with her sisters, and of course my grandmother with everybody. 
So uh, it seems like a nothing thing at the moment, but it is a pleasant memory now. Mm -hmm. Another thing I remember about her, though, you know, she was a, was a very devout pacifist, as, as, as a good Quaker should be. But I remember often on a Sunday, my grandmother would ask uh, one of us to drive her to Sawtell, which was the veterans' hospital way across town. It took about an hour to get there. And, and she would uh, pack some goodies, oh, cakes that she had baked and cookies and that sort of thing. And she'd spend a couple of hours over there going among uh, the wounded soldiers and so forth. This, of course, was after World War I. And uh, uh, reading to them, writing letters for them and so forth. While she didn't, while she hated war, uh, she loved those that had to fight it. Wasn't it uh, her use of plain speech or the use of plain speech amongst herself and the... Um and her uh, and the sisters that uh, convinced you that uh, many years later during the Hiss case that uh, Chambers was uh, telling the truth about part of his memories of Hiss? One of the factors that did, yes. See, the difficulty in the Hiss Chambers case uh, when we were at that stage, when we were attempting to decide or prove that Hiss knew Chambers after Hiss denied having known him, uh, was that Although we had had from Chambers, I prepared an enormous number of questions to Chambers about everything he knew about Hiss, and he was able to say, uh, for example, uh, describe all of the houses that Hiss had lived in, describe the cars, describe his family, describe his wife's uh, flushing uh, when she was excited, and so forth and so on. But the problem was whether or not Chambers could have known all those things and didn't know them independ by, uh, independently. Uh, the problem was whether or not Chambers could not have studied Hiss's life and then told us about all those things without ever having known Hiss himself. But I recall one time when I went up the Chambers farm, we were sitting out on the porch uh, looking over the, uh, his cattle, which he was very proud of, and Mrs. Chambers, it was a very hot day, brought us out some cold lemonade. And uh, as we were drinking it, uh, yeah, I, uh, I asked him uh, uh, to tell me a little more about the background of uh, uh, Mrs. Hiss. Uh, and I mentioned, happened to mention in passing that I was a Quaker. And uh, he said, and he snapped his fingers, he said, Priscilla was a Quaker. Uh, let me say that again. Uh, I remember that <clears throat> I happened, when I went up to see him, I mentioned uh, that uh, I was a Quaker. Uh, and he said, you know, Priscilla Hiss was a Quaker, too. Uh, and then he snapped his finger, and he says, that reminds me of something. She always used the plain speech, or she quite often used the plain speech uh, when she was talking to Alger. And I thought for a moment, that the way he said it, I mean, he could have, others could have told him that uh, Mrs. Hiss being a Quaker sometimes used the plain speech when she's talking to her husband. But the way he said it so spontaneously Said this, he's talking about a man he knows, not somebody he's read about. The uh, the, <coughs> the uh, Quaker families at that time too were sort of extended families. Uh, in that, uh, when you, uh, for example, uh, when you wanted to take music lessons, or when your parents mm -hmm. wanted to uh, encourage your music lessons, you went and stayed with Aunt Jane yes. uh, in Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me say that. Uh, when you speak of an extended family, you're right. First, it was a very big family. And uh, my first music lessons, actually, were, were from my, uh, my Uncle Griffith, who was my mother's half-brother. He was the, he was, uh, the, uh, the oldest uh, and a marvelous man. And I took lessons from him uh, about a time I was seven years of age. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got to do a little puffing here. My mother recalls that I, uh, I uh, played by ear which I did before I ever took any lessons. And I remember the first song I ever played was uh, Joy to the World, the Christmas Carol. Well, after she'd heard a little of that playing by ear, I could pick out tunes and so forth. She uh, uh, had Uncle Griffith give me lessons and piano and violin. And then when I was in the seventh grade, Aunt Jane, who was a very accomplished pianist, as was Uncle Griffith, uh, came down to the Christmas Year reunion, as a matter of fact, and she heard me play a couple of pieces. She says, Richard, these 
uh, it's, you have got to come up and have lessons. She spoke to my father and mother about it. And so I went back with her and Alden and Sheldon, her children, and my Uncle Harold, her husband. Uh, it was a great trip going back. I remember, it, I remember it particularly for a rather curious reason. It's the first time I ever saw snow. Uh, at least I had seen it on the mountains before from Yorba Linda because that was a, a marvelous place in those days. You, before the days of smog, you could see the snow in the wintertime on Mount Baldy, and uh, you could see Catalina if you got up on one of the little hills off in the distance 25 miles away. Uh, but I had never been in snow, and we got out of the cars. We went over the Tehachapi, and I played in the snow there, and I was really excited, and I said, golly, this is fun. And Alden said to me, uh, rather uh, sternly, he says, we don't say golly at our house. Now, I thought I'd been raised rather strictly, but when I got up there to the Beesons, believe me, it was strict. But she was a marvelous teacher, and I, I became quite advanced for that age. I could uh, play Sending's Rustle of Spring, which, of course, everybody learns to play who has any advancement at all, Grieg, a few other things. Weren't you, uh, uh, I've read somewhere that you were sort of the, uh, class cut up there and that you and uh, one of your cousins did something with a clove of garlic that got you in trouble. I don't think I recall that. Uh, I read that you, uh, that you ate a clove before going into the class and then breathed on the, on the, uh, the girl students next to you. Well, I, th I think I know what you mean now. It was, it was very unpleasant and incidentally, uh, I've really not liked garlic ever since then. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a little of it goes a long way. Aunt, uh, your Aunt Beth was one of your favorites. Yes. Aunt Beth was uh, younger than my mother, and, and she had a marvelous voice. Uh, I remember her and uh, uh, my uh, singing, for example, in church a beautiful soprano voice. And she was so full of life and so very pretty and always jolly and fun, always uh, cutting up and so forth and so on. And uh, I'll never forget that one of the most uh, uh, moving moments was, and a very sad moment, was when she got cancer. And, and I remember that she went to all these quacks and one time went clear back in the middle of the country where somebody had some scheme where you burn it off. And then she came back, and then finally she died. And she was so young and so pretty and so vibrant and left three children. I, uh, uh, it, it was a difficult time for us. Hmm. The, uh, of course, let me say, uh, all of my aunts were something, too. I mean, my Aunt Edith, which was the oldest one, my mother's oldest sister, uh, she was uh, married to Uncle Tim, Tim Timberlake. And, uh, he was an excellent, uh, uh, what do you call it, the people that deal with insects? And ed anyway, uh, entomologists. Uh, and they spent, which was meant a great deal to us, they spent some time in Hawaii uh, and then came back and then they were at Riverside. And I remember at the family reunions, Uncle Tim would come there and he'd always bring along one of these nets and uh, he'd go out and collect butterflies and insects and everybody thought he was a little strange. And in our family, too, if I may digress, they thought he was a little strange for another reason, because he smoked a pipe. Nobody else smoked. You see, in those days, my mother didn't drink or smoke, neither did my father, and none of my relatives that I know of, except Uncle Tim, he smoked a pipe. Uh, one year, incidentally, I did do something which uh, my mother really didn't disapprove of. Uh, we had Prince Albert tobacco there in the store, and uh, I got some. We would sell it, although we wouldn't use it ourselves, and I got a big can of it and gave it to him for Christmas. Uh, but they always made him smoke his pipe outside. Uh, but, then my, but he got a, a, what was considered a handsome salary of $300 a month over at the University of California Experiment Station. And my Aunt Edith was so generous when I went to Duke to uh, law school, they didn't have any money. Every Christmas she sent me $25, even though she had three children. And I thought that was generous. Uh, my Aunt Martha, who was the, my, just a, uh, the one between Edith and my mother, uh, was a nurse, a, pra a uh, registered nurse, and after all of her children were grown, continued a nurse between the time she was 70 and 85 years of age, enormously competent. Uh, my Aunt 
I, I mentioned a moment ago uh, Aunt Olive, who's still living. You've met her, gentle and kind and so forth. Uh, she and Uncle Oscar, at 75 years of age, uh, while I was president, went way out to Kenya for a year with the American Friends Service Committee to work in a hospital out there. Incidentally, I had just thought of one thing about my Uncle Oscar. Uh, he, of course, being a Quaker, uh, was a conscientious objector in World War I, uh, but it wasn't because he was afraid, because he volunteered to go over with the American Friends Service Committee. And so he went over to France. And I remember he brought back with him a collection of shells and grenades and so forth. And I remember that it was in the bedroom that they had there at the big house because they were living with my grandmother. And my brothers and my cousins and I, we used to just revel in going into the bedrooms and taking up these shells, being informed, of course, that they were no longer dangerous. But that was as close as we came to World War I. Excuse me, gentlemen, one second. Lessons. Oh, yeah. We've got a Fine. Film sure, sure, film sure. Your mother sure. Talking. Sure. Yes. Not not right away, but uh, in a, in a minute. Yes. quite a bunch of characters, weren't they? Yes, they were. Mark and all that. Eisenhower used to uh, urge you to refer more to God in your speeches, uh, and yet uh, you resisted. Why did you do that, and, and how do you think of the, uh, what is, the, what is the, the legacy to you of your early Quaker family background <coughs> and training? Well, first I would say that Eisenhower uh, mentioned to me, I don't think from a crass political standpoint, but simply because he knew that I had a religious background, as he did, uh, he felt that uh, I should refer uh, to God in my speeches, as he did, uh, because uh, it was good politically and also it was honest. The difficulty was that uh, it goes clear back to my, my mother's attitude and my father's too, that while we uh, during those early years, uh, and they through all their years, were churchgoers regularly and uh, tithe and all the things you do uh, if you're a good Christian and so forth. We never wore it on the sleeve. And uh, consequently, I just always felt embarrassed, frankly, I, uneasy. I, I, whenever I would say, uh, 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 use God, the word God in a speech to refer to God and so forth and so on, it was too familiar. Uh, I didn't consider God to be familiar. Uh, I couldn't, uh, Billy Graham and I used to have it out on this several times. Billy used to mention the fact that uh, it was very important to, for me to emphasize more my Christian background and so forth. And I just uh, never could bring myself to do it. Uh, perhaps it was a mistake. If I had, maybe uh, would have won a, a close election that I lost. The uh, next to religion, the Quakers uh, place a, a tremendous 
importance on education. Whittier College, I think, was founded the same year that the town was founded. They built the church and built the college. Uh, I think your mother taught you at home before you went mm -hmm. to school, and that, that had a great uh, yes. influence My on mother, uh, as a matter of fact, taught me to read before I ever went to school. And as a result, uh, I skipped one of the early grades, I think the second grade. Uh, and also, she influenced me greatly in, in the whole area of music, because she could play the piano. Uh, she wasn't, of course, accomplished like my Aunt Jane or, uh, or my Uncle Griffith. She was not a teacher. Uh, but her influence in those early years uh, was enormous in that respect. My, as I say, my, from my father, I got that competitive, com uh, competitive uh, arguing ability and perhaps uh, a tendency to gesture a bit at time to time. But from my mother, uh, more the, the, the dedication to uh, scholarship and an early start. It's just great to have, you know, when you stop to think uh, of what a parent can do for a child, uh, and people say, well, get them the best tutors and ship them off here and there and everything. The best thing a parent can do to a child, and Mrs. Nixon does this, Pat does, with our two, spend time with them, spend time with them. And that's carried all down through. Julie spends hours with her two, Jenny and uh, the little boy, uh, and uh, Alex. And uh, Tricia spends hours with Christopher. And as a result, they're very advanced. Uh, I think they do that because they know their mother did it and they know their grandmother did it. Your first uh, musical uh, rendering was Joy to the World. It certainly was. I can still play it, too. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I played that by ear. Uh, all of my playing now is by ear in the key of G. Uh, and uh, I also uh, played in Sunday school, uh, in, uh, in church on occasion, uh, for many, many years. Uh, reading music, uh, I did not become a good reader of music, uh, but I had a very good memory and uh, of the, the, the classical numbers. Uh, later on, I picked it up in college after I dropped it. See, I, I dropped, I, after I went up to Aunt Jane's in my seventh grade, then in the eighth grade, I was busy with other things, and I didn't continue. And then in college, uh, I, I didn't, in high school years, I didn't uh, take any music. I played in the orchestra, a violin, a second violin, not very well. But then in college, a remarkable woman, Margaretha Lohman, a concert pianist, uh, heard me play something from memory that I'd played at some sort of a college function. And, and uh, she called me Richard, like uh, my mother did, uh, rather than Dick, which all the other kids. She says, Richard, she says, you have a talent here. She says, I want you to take some lessons. She said, uh, you've got to get acquainted with Brahms and Bach. And so I took lessons. And it, I don't know how I did it in that junior year. Uh, because in that year I went out for football, uh, I was, had the lead in the junior play, uh, I was on the debating team, uh, I did re quite well on my studies in that year. Uh, I worked at home uh, in, in the grocery store, uh, went to market every morning and so forth and so on, and yet took lessons. Well, it doesn't show I'm so great, but it does show she was pretty inspirational because uh, I, I appreciated Brahms and Bach. In fact, my favorite number and I have been trying to get Van Cliburn to put it on a record for me. It was Brahms, Rhapsody, and G, uh, which I can still play little bits of. We have a, f a film uh, of your mother uh, talking about your early musical prowess. I don't mm. know whether you've seen this before. No, I haven't. No, I didn't know that. I've never seen that before. It shows my mother must have had a good feeling about politics, that she would allow them to film to her film talking her. on the phone. Yeah. Did you ever consider being, being a serious musician? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, not, uh, not in the college years. But I think the time I considered is after I finished at Lindsay, uh, when I was 12 years old and I came back. And then I went to Fullerton High School. and then. It really came down to a choice. Would I, where I did play the in Fullerton, I did play the violin in the orchestra. It came down to a choice: would I concentrate on music, or should I move to debating and other areas? 
Uh, and uh, I finally moved in the other direction and didn't pick it up again until I got to college. Uh, sometimes I, I rather regret it. I, you regret many things. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't want to be a musician and I didn't want to be uh, a uh, <coughs> service station operator or a race car driver or anything else. I wanted to be an engineer, a railroad engineer. And I remember Everett Barnum used to come uh, on on the train from Needles, California. He had to run from Needles to Los Angeles. And the train would go by and you could hear the whistle at night. And boy, I thought, wouldn't it be great to be a railroad engineer? Not only to run the engines, not so much that, but to see different places and all that sort of thing. But in terms of the music thing, uh, I have always had a feeling that I'd like to be able to express myself in music, to be able to compose it. Uh, I've always felt I like organ music, particularly in the great cathedrals of Europe and in this country as well. And I've always felt what, how great it would be to be able to play a great organ uh, and, and to improvise and compose. And I've also had a sort of a secret yearning to, uh, uh, to really direct a great symphony orchestra. But all of that's by the boards now. I mean, it, uh, it never came to pass. Incidentally, I should, uh, uh, the, uh, well, that's enough. I would bet you that when these programs are aired, you will get offers from half a dozen cathedrals to give you the key and let you go in and uh, improvise at the, at the keyboards. Oh, I'm past that point now. I don't have the flexibility in my fingers that I used to have. <coughs> you, uh, in the uh, 46 and 50 campaigns... Incidentally, I should say, incidentally, that as I understand, playing an organ is much more difficult than the piano. It's like the difference between flying an airplane and a helicopter. When you fly an airplane, uh, of course, you use your hand. You fly a helicopter, you've got to use your feet and your hands. And the same is true with an organ. So I have a hard enough time doing the piano. I don't think I could do the organ. If you could, uh, if uh, uh, Zabin Metha came in and offered you his baton and his orchestra, uh, do you have a piece you would, uh, an orchestral piece that you would choose to conduct? Well, it would be symphonic without question. Uh, not uh, not modern music, not Rhapsody in Blue or any of the, although I like that, uh, none of the musical comedies and so forth. Of course, Beta probably wouldn't ask for those. I would think, uh, uh, and this is sort of in between, that I would like to conduct, uh, for example, a, a, a number that uh, always seemed to give me a lift, and that was Victory at Sea, the score from Victory at Sea. Uh, which is a great score. Uh, and another one is uh, Liszt's Preludes. I have a li interesting, which I, it's interesting, but also a little, I think, uh, uh, rather exasperating anecdote about that. I, I recall that in my second inauguration, uh, they asked me what I wanted to play, and so uh, I mentioned Liszt's Prelude. The orchestra leader refused. And I said, why did he refuse to play it? They said, because it was one of Hitler's favorites. And I thought, my God. Of course, I knew Wagner was supposed to be uh, too close to Hitler and so forth. Uh, I don't much care for Wagnerian music anyway, because I'm not that much of an opera buff. But Beethoven, uh, Hitler liked Beethoven. He liked Wagner and so forth. Does that mean, and he liked Liszt, does that mean that a great orchestra playing for uh, the inauguration of a president of the United States and want to play it? I thought it was a little bit much. In the uh, 46 and 50 campaigns, you played the piano. Uh, uh, you played fairly often, I think, as a uh, sort of as a technique of campaigning. In those days, people were used to gathering around a yeah. piano and, and uh, singing. Did you, um, uh, did you want your daughters to learn? Oh, yes. Did, you, did they take lessons? Well, we, we oh, yes, we, we went through that. The musical heritage, though, didn't go beyond me. Uh, both Yuli and Tricia like music. Uh, Pat uh, naturally wanted to give them opportunity to learn. We bought an accordion for one and gave piano lessons to the other. To Tricia particularly, I remember, <laughs> I remember an incident on that, that this was uh, about, I would say, 1956. And uh, at that time, uh, she would have been 10 years old and she was taking piano lessons for the first time. And I was trying to help her one night. And uh, I was telling her, you know, honey, I said the most important thing in learning to play the piano is to practice. 
I said, it's tiring and boring, but if you practice, you can be as good as you want to be. She thought a moment, and she looked at me. and said, you know, Daddy, you should have practiced more when you were a little boy. If you had, you might have become famous and have gone to Hollywood, and they would have buried you in a special place. Do um, you, uh, the, the Nixon market was uh, a successful operation added to the service station. One of the uh, things that uh, it specialized in were your mother's pies and cakes. Mm -hmm. Did you participate oh, yes. in the work yes. of the market? Well, let me say that not only my mother's pies and cakes, but to show you how, what competence uh, the old man had. Uh, when my mother had to go to Arizona with Harold, uh, who had tuberculosis and spent three year, two, over two years there with him, my, my dad uh, made the pies and cakes himself, in addition to everything else he was doing. They weren't as, quite as good as my mother's, but they were good. Uh, the only problem that both of them had is that when Christmas came around, they made some excellent mincemeat, but they wouldn't put any brandy in it. Uh, one time, uh, Don and I, uh, Don was working the store at that time, we uh, sneaked in a bottle and put some in, and they thought it was the best mincemeat they'd ever made, but they didn't know why. But be that as it may, I remember my mother made those marvelous lemon pies, and apple pies, not the kind where you use the, the, the apples that are already cooked, but the ones where you slice them in raw and, it, and then it bulges up the crust and so forth. Their crusts were fantastic and great mince pie. And the prices were wonderful too. What did they cost? Uh, lemon, lemon, 25 cents. Apple, 30 cents. Cherry, 30 cents. Mince, 35 cents. And uh, anyway, the, she, also did, uh, she also was very good at cakes. And her specialty, rather than devil's food, was angel's food, which I guess tells us something, too. And I remember so well that she had a sort of a fetish about it, however. She felt that it was important uh, to get the fresh air into her. And so instead of beating, as you know, with angel food cake, you take the whites of eggs and then you beat them like that. Or now they do it with a mixer. These are the days before mixers, or it was then at least. And I remember my mother in Yorba Linda and later on in Whittier, particularly when she was baking them for the store, uh, she'd stand out on the porch on those cold California mornings, because as you know, it can be very cold in California in the morning. She's beating uh, those uh, uh, egg whites for angel food cake. And believe me, I think they were a little better with that fresh air in them. Were you a serious child? Most people think so. Uh, that is, those, uh, the psychohistorians say so. Uh, but as far as my family is concerned, uh, they, uh, they say that I, uh, I studied hard and I worked hard, uh, but that uh, we also had a lot of fun. And uh, we uh, like the garlic story and a few others that you've heard about. Was your mother a disciplinarian as well? In a very quiet way, yes. Uh, but she would do it with a look. Uh, if you did something that was wrong, you knew it, and she'd just look at you. Or very quietly, very softly, she would say something. Incidentally, I have something about pies that will interest you. How uh, I mentioned earlier my Aunt Ollie, uh, who was so gentle and kind and thoughtful always of other people's feelings. I remember one family reunion, Aunt Ollie had made uh, uh, an apple pie, and uh, we were eating it, and uh, I said, uh, I was just a, maybe eight years old at the time, I said, Aunt Ollie, says, this is even better than, Ma, uh, than mother's. Aunt Ollie didn't say anything at the moment. My mother says, that's right, Ollie, it certainly is. Later on, Aunt Ollie took me aside, and she says, Richard, just remember, nobody makes better pies than your mother. Mm. And it was a lesson I never forgot. Here, we, here I was, of course, trying to praise her, but not sensitive to the fact that in praising her, it might have been something my mother wouldn't appreciate. Although my mother, of course, was so big that she sort of laughed about it. Thinking about uh, apple pies, I remember once you mentioned uh, how you were 
thinking back to your mother's apple pies, how you were impressed with the film? Was it uh, Waterloo Bridge? Yes. As a matter of fact, I mentioned that to Jimmy Stewart, uh, Jimmy Stewart in Waterloo Bridge. Uh, I mentioned it to him about eight years, seven years ago when I was at Chasen's Restaurant in Los Angeles, and he was there with his wife, Gloria. And I went over to the table before leaving and, and paid my respects. And I said, you know, you've made so many movies, but I remember Waterloo Bridge. And uh, I remember particularly, uh, there was a moment uh, when you were talking to this girl who was sort of a woman of fortune, and uh, you were trying to tell her uh, what you thought of her. And uh, what you said was that uh, you compared her and your feeling toward her with the way you felt about your mother and her apple pies. She said, uh, my mother made great apple pie. And she said, after she died, I've never liked apple pie since, because there was nothing to compare with it. It was something like that, but Jimmy remembered. He appreciated the fact that it had an impact. Do, uh, I read a story about your mother at the store uh, or at the time of the store, that you had taken some grapes from a nearby arbor, and she... As a matter of fact, that occurred earlier. Uh, when we were in Yarba Linda, uh, which was uh, a very small town, everybody knew everybody else, of course, and one of our closest neighbor was Mrs. neighbors was Mrs. Trueblood. It's only a great Quaker name, as you know. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Trueblood was a very kind lady and a very good friend of my mother's. And one day, uh, my brother and I, I think it was Don and I, we were over playing near the Truebloods, and the Concord grapes were just coming, and they were beautiful. And so we took some, we ate them. And we got home, why, of course, those Concord grapes was all over our face, and my mother said, where did you do get those? What happened? And we said, we got them at Mrs. Trueblood's. She said, now you should not have done that. And she gave each of us five cents. And he said, you take that over and give it to Mrs. Trueblood. Well, I remember we gave the five cents to Mrs. Trueblood, and she didn't want to take it. And I could see, she, I remember even to this day, she seemed to have tears in her eyes. But of course, she had to take it. But we never forgot that. We didn't get any more grapes. We didn't take any more there or anyplace else. During the time of the store, your father, uh, which is surprising in a man who was as uh, as, as tough a dealer as he, was burned by some tire buyers. Oh, yes. Once, but never again. Uh, you have to understand that we were operating in the store uh, in the years just before the Depression and during the Depression. And it was on a very close margin. And because of the illness in our family, uh, our budget was pretty tight. And so, therefore, we had to be concerned about any uh, any losses that might occur. But one of the biggest profit items in the service station uh, was tires. And incidentally, when I give you these figures it's to show you that tires is one of the few items in America that has not gone up in price. Because on this occasion, uh, a fellow came along one day. Uh, he was in a big car. Uh, it was a big Buick, as I recall. And he had three children and his wife with him. And he needed two tires. Uh, and so uh, he uh, picked up two of the best tires that we had. It would cost $67 for two tires. Uh, and so the old man uh, uh, changed the tires, uh, uh, put them back on the wheels and so forth. Uh, and uh, the fellow uh, uh, was very uh, impressive looking, gave, gave him a check for him for $67. And my father was so appreciative of making this very big sale where you'd make a profit of about 10 bucks on the 67 that he gave each of those children, I remember, a candy bar. And then so they drove off. Two days later, the check bounced. And I must say that uh, my mother and father, I heard them talking about it at the dinner table. They couldn't understand how that could have happened. Uh, but from that on, then on, at, at my father's place, unless he knew the people, it was cash and carry. Were you? Was Although we did have credit, let me say. And a lot of people never paid the bills, and uh, we didn't press them too hard either. This was the, um, 
a time when a lot of uh, important historical things uh, were happening uh, in the outside world at any rate. Do you have any memory of the First World War or its impact on the town? Well, the First World War, I have a vivid memory of when it ended, of Armistice Day. And I understand I was only then uh, five years old, but I can remember this day. Uh, we lived in Yorba Linda then. We went over to Placentia. They were going to have a parade. The American Legion had a parade. And I remember they had an effigy of the Kaiser uh, hanging uh, on a, uh, a, uh, one of the floats. And I thought it was the real Kaiser that they had him hanging there. Do you remember getting the first radio? Oh, very well. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was called a Gil Fillon. Uh, I don't know that they even make it anymore. It's a great big thing. It's like, as a matter of fact, when I went to Russia and to China, I saw these huge radios, uh, which, of course, before you get miniaturization, miniaturization is the way it was. And it reminded me of that old Gil Fillon radio. And uh, the reason my parents got it, however, was not for the music, but they got it for the religious programs. Uh, they loved listening to uh, Amy McPherson and Bob Shuler and the great evangelists on the radio. And so they got this, they made the expenditure for that. But I remember radio even before we got that fancy one. Uh, my brother Harold was very good on me mechanical things too. And uh, we got a crystal set. And you know, you take that and you, you, you did various things. I don't know, he was better at it than I was. And, and we used to tune in on things uh, on the crystal set, including a boxing match now and then, how things have changed. But as let me say, not having radio and not having television was not all that bad because we made up for that in conversation and in reading. And uh, so consequently, I've always said, and fortunately Pat totally agrees with me, and both Trisha and Julie did, uh, limit people on TV. Uh, because you miss so much if you miss reading and conversation. Uh, people just don't do that anymore. They don't know how to talk. What did you read as a child? Well, <clears throat> we had access to uh, a Wonder World set. Uh, it was sort of a, I suppose, a children's psych encyclopedia. And I remembered particularly that I was interested in the history. Uh, I was in, it, in the Greek mythology and that sort of thing. We also had a book, I remember a book that we had, of, uh, which I think my father gave to me, of the great heroes of early America. And I remember Mad Anthony Wayne and Nathaniel Green, who was the Quaker who uh, uh, fought in the Revolutionary Wars. I, those stick in mind. But I read those stories over and over again. And then there were magazines, the Ladies' Home Journal, which my mother took, uh, the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, and the National Geographic, which we didn't take, but which my, uh, the Marshburns, uh, my aunt, Uncle Oscar and Aunt Olive took, and I used to go up there and borrow it. Uh, I've learned since, of course, never loan it because they seldom come back, but I love to turn through that, pages of that magazine and think of the far off places I wanted to go. Well, the other thing we read was the Bible. Uh, and and uh, I don't say this uh, simply because it's expected to be said, but the Bible is not just a great book, it's, it's a great collection of books. I remember one who was not particularly religious of my college professors, Albert Upton, as a matter of fact, I think he was an agnostic, uh, but he once said to me, the greatest book ever written was Ecclesiastes. And it is a great book, and you can read it today, and the profundity of it. And I, f and I don't think that we missed a thing by not having quite as much to read, but having higher quality. So we, I read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, anything else that happened to come out. It wasn't too much, but uh, what we had was pretty good. Counting as one of the major historical events at the time, uh, from your point of view, must have been your first baseball game. Oh, I remember that very well. Uh, Shorty Hedges, a neighbor, uh, and I, and classmate, uh, when I was about uh, 12 years old, uh, we took the streetcar, the big red car, they called them, Pacific Electric, over to L.A., Los Angeles, uh, to see a baseball game at Wrigley Field. Uh, that was when the Los Angeles Angels was a, a minor, minor league, a double A, but minor league. And they were playing the San Francisco Seals in a doubleheader. 
I don't remember much about it except that I remember that the, the angel's uh, catcher was named Truck Hanna. He was a great catcher and he could hit but he couldn't run and so he never made the major leagues. Uh, and the pitcher that day, and this I remember very well because he won the game, was Charlie Root uh, who pitched for the Angels and later went up to uh, the, the Cubs and he was the one that threw the gopher ball to Babe Ruth and Babe Ruth pointed and then hit it over the fence. Charlie Root was the pitcher and I followed that. I followed incidentally sports. We spoke of what I read, we read the newspapers. Uh, I read newspapers uh, from a very, very early age. We took the Los Angeles Times and it was delivered in Yarba Linda and later in Whittier and I used to read it from cover to cover and I used to really read the sports pages and I can tell you about virtually everything in sports from Big Bill Tilden and tennis to the Olympic stars to the basketball, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but getting on to this baseball game, while I remember the games and I remember that the Angels, I think, split the, the, the two games, what I particularly remember is the hot dogs. Uh, and Shorty and I bought hot dogs and each of us, you get them for 10 cents each and we each had a dollar to spend. We each had six. And the guy came around at the last, the place wasn't sold out and he had two left and he says, look, I'll give you these for a nickel apiece. Shorty said, no way, I don't have room. And so though it was a bargain, that was one time we didn't take it. This, uh, this was uh, the time, and you've, you've uh, subsequently written about the, uh, the sadness of it, that your brother Arthur, Arthur died. Uh, you had just uh, come back from being with uh, Aunt Jane in uh, Lindsay, I believe, and he uh, mm -hmm. developed a headache that... Yeah. Uh, well, from this picture, you can see he was a very, very handsome fellow, uh, young fellow. Uh, he was uh, five years younger than I, and uh, uh, he was, uh, of course, the favorite of the family. Um, I, uh, we had a very close tie. As a matter of fact, I remember when he, he came up with my mother and father and Don uh, to pick me up at Lindsay. They drove up there. and. Uh, when he got out of the car and saw me, he ran to me and he kissed me very, rather quietly and not too much uh, notice on the cheek. Later, my mother said that on the way up, uh, he had asked her, would it be all right if I kiss Richard on the cheek? And she said, okay. Which, of course, is another indication of the way that we, uh, we are quite private. As a matter of fact, I've taken a lot of heat from many of the people, uh, many of my my uh, female supporters and uh, non-supporters and critics because uh, uh, I just don't believe in the public kissing. It's very difficult. I don't mind bussing somebody on the forehead or the cheek and so forth, but uh, we just don't do it. I don't mind if others do it. It doesn't bother me a bit. But with Pat, as you note, and so forth, it's, uh, it's just a sense of privacy. It's just something we didn't do. We didn't grow up that way. Anyway, we came on down. With, after we, back, uh, we came on down from Lindsay, and after we got back, Arthur complained of a headache. Uh, incidentally, uh, you, in retrospect, uh, we might have guessed that it might have been because of cigarettes, because uh, he, uh, he had a mind of his own. And I remember when about two years before that, when he was five years old, he got a package of cigarettes out of the store and he took it out in back of the store and he proceeded to smoke one of them. And a, a nosy neighbor reported to my mother, and I must say, I didn't much care about that or her sense. But anyway, uh, it wasn't cigarettes this time. Uh, it tur turned out to be uh, tubercular meningitis. Uh, nothing could be done about it, absolutely nothing. And so uh, I recall so well, uh, oh, the days before he died, uh, and... Uh, I recall particularly, you, you, you hear of my father, this tough, rough, diamond and rough. I never forget it after the doctor, Dr. Wilson from Whittier had gone up and diagnosed the case after they'd make a spinal tap and found that it was tuberculosis meningitis and said that there was no hope. He came down the stairs and my father said, they say he was crying uncontrollably. He says, they say the little darling's gonna die. Well, anyway, we, uh, then two days, after that, a couple of days after the doctor did it, uh, gave that uh, 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 prognosis, 
uh, we went up to see him, and he was awake. Uh, he had come out of a coma, and uh, he asked his mother if he couldn't have some tomato gravy. He liked tomato gravy on toast, and so he, they hadn't let him eat much, and so I remember she brought it up to him, and he had that. And then uh, shortly thereafter, he uh, just went to sleep, and uh, so that was the end. Some uh, years later, when you were in college, you wrote a, uh, an essay uh, about your brother, about Arthur, that, uh, that your mother kept. And uh, it opened, uh, the essay opened with a, a reference to the picture and uh, that was always kept in the, uh, in the sitting room. And uh, I wonder if you could read some of it, uh, from some of it. All right, let's see. I'll have to put my glasses on for that. <laughs> When this was written in about 1930, as a, uh, or just before as a high school composition no. exercise. Oh, this was written in 1930, uh, written in 1930 when I was uh, a freshman in college, freshman in college, written for freshman English, I remember. Well, it isn't great literature, but uh, perhaps it indicates uh, how the, that particular event uh, affected all of us. Uh, I, was I was describing him. I remember how his eyes changed from their original baby blue to an almost black shade, and how his hair, blonde at first, became dark brown, and how his mouth, toothless for five months, was filled with tiny white teeth, which, by the way, were exceedingly sharp when applied on soft fingers or toes, which happened to get within their reach, and how those little coherent, incoherent sounds of his finally developed into words and then into sentences how he learned to roll over and then to crawl and finally to walk. Although I do not remember many incidents connected with my brother's early childhood, there were some which made a clear imprint on my mind. There was one time when he was asked to be a ring bearer at a wedding. I remember how my mother had to work with him for hours to get him to do it because he disliked walking with a little flower girl. Another time when he's about five years old, he showed the world that he was a man by getting some cigarettes out of our store and secretly smoking them back of the house. Unfortunately for him, one of our gossipy neighbors happened to see him and she promptly informed my mother. I have disliked that neighbor from that time. And again, I shall never forget how he disliked wearing sticky, woolly suits. As soon as he was able to read, he used to search the mail order catalogs for suits which weren't sticky. There's a grave now out in the hills, but like the picture, it contains only the bodily image of my brother. And so when I'm tired and worried and I'm almost ready to quit trying to live as I should, I look up, I see the picture of a little boy with sparkling eyes and curly hair. I remember the childlike prayer. I pray that it may prove true for me as I did for my brother Arthur. The prayer I was referring to was just before he died, or the day before he died, and went to the final coma, he uh, had his, my mother come to the bed, and he said, I want to uh, uh, say the, my prayers. And uh, the prayer, of course, is the very well-known one, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, I pray the Lord my soul to keep uh, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then uh, that was the, the last words he ever spoke. You um, started uh, school or uh, started uh, high school in 1926. Right. What kind of a, uh, what kind of a student were you? I was a pretty good student, uh, not because I was so uh, with any inherited genius, uh, but I worked hard, and uh, uh, I was I was very good in Latin. I had four years of straight A's, perhaps a lot of help from my mother in that. I was very good in English, very good in history. Uh, they were easy for me, uh, and uh, uh, I had, however, great difficulty with math and science. 
but I managed to do them well uh, because it's always been my theory in life uh, that the real test of a person is not how you do the things you like well, but how you do the things you don't like well. Not how well you do the easy things, but how well you do the tough things. And so whenever I had something in math or science that was real tough, uh, to me it was a challenge, and I'd work harder on that than I would on, like, uh, my English composition, which was uh, like falling off a log for me. You once uh, told a story about a, a, a geometry problem that uh, that if you got if you got the answer to the problem you didn't it, it, it gave you an A for the course. Yes, the teacher was Miss Ernsberger. Uh, she uh, was, uh, as I recall, and she was uh, she was very good, a German background, and and she gave us the challenge. This is a very difficult geometric problem. And she said, did anyone that got the answer to that problem we get an A for the course? Well, I took it home, and I worked all night. I remember it was a very, very cold night because uh, I, I came downstairs from the upstairs bedroom where we were sleeping and uh, came down to the kitchen and sat at the kitchen table. Uh, I lit the uh, fire in the uh, stove, which was a gas stove, opened it up, the oven, as well as to heat the room. And just as the dawn came up, I got the answer, and I got the A. I haven't the slightest idea, as I recall, what it was about, but I got an A for the course, and, but it was because of an all-night vigil. You were, uh, you were active in, in debate and dramatics in school, I know, in sports. In dramatics, I, I think you made, a, uh, you made a very impressive dramatic debut. Well, it was, uh, it's, in retrospect, uh, my first dramatic uh, appearance uh, was uh, uh, should really have been my last because it was an almost unbelievably horrendous experience. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, I was fairly proficient in Latin, and uh, at Whittier High School, uh, we always the, the, which had a very strong Latin department. In fact, it was a requirement for, at Whittier no longer, but was then, for graduation, for those that wanted to go to college. But in any event, uh, in this uh, particular uh, year, it was my senior year, uh, the Latin play, not in Latin but in English, was the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid, mm -hmm. which of course we had studied. It's the fourth year Latin course in most high schools, was then at least. And uh, I played the part of Aeneas, and my girlfriend, Ola Florence Welch, played the part of Dido. Well, it was uh, quite an experience in two different ways. First, at one point, uh, a very dramatic moment, uh, the script calls for Aeneas and uh, Dido to embrace. In fact, it calls for Aeneas to kiss Dido. I wouldn't do that, but at least we agreed that we would embrace. And I'll never forget, and I threw my arms around uh, uh, Dido, uh, i.e., Ola Florence, the hoots and the cat calls and the whistles from all the kids out there. And well, I, we both turned red and got through the play. But what was really made it worse was that I was in excruciating pain. I had a, uh, they, they rented costumes, and I had to have silver boots. And uh, they came in from the costume people. I was only about 5'9 at that time. I didn't get up to my 5'11". Uh, until I got to college. Uh, but uh, in any event, they must have thought, uh, they figured, uh, tried to guess what my shoe size was. They didn't realize my feet were already uh, 11D, which they are today, which is pretty big, even for one who's 5'11". So they had a 5'9 uh, boot. Well, it took two Latin teachers and the school janitor to get them on me. And I walked around that stage, and every, every step was the most excruciating experience. And let me say this, I've never worn boots since. I'm just thinking, I have for at least 10 pairs of boots have been given to me in my campaigns. Uh, campaigns in Texas in 52, 56, 1960, again in 1968, 1972. And I've given them all away. I can't stand boots because I remember the horror of having to wear boots in that play. You, uh, you were also very active and very successful in debate at this time, and, and I, I think you've uh, uh, 
or I've heard you say that uh, the teacher who taught you a natural sense of speaking uh, or natural style of speaking as opposed to the rather uh, florid type that was popular at the time uh, accounted for a lot of your subsequent success in debate and yes. in politics. I, I remember his name very well. Uh, H. Lynn Schuller, he was called. Uh, many didn't like him because he was a very tough grader. Uh, but I have found, incidentally, that my best teachers, in retrospect, were those who were toughest on me. Uh, I, I remember, for example, that uh, my, uh, my teacher of history, Jenny Levin, uh, was, was awfully tough grader uh, uh, in U.S. history. So tough, as a matter of fact, the parents complained so much, uh, they made her teach study hall, uh, and, uh, w which was a great loss. Uh, but in any event, uh, I, can, I can remember that H. Lynn Schuller used to, uh, was, it would have been great in today's television age, I think, because he would have told people what they need to hear, and that is be yourself, be natural. Uh, those were the days when there were oratorical contests, and I won quite a few of them, uh, when you had automatic gestures, you know, and great flights of oratory and so forth. But Scheller used to say over and over again, remember, speechy, speaking is conversation. If you have an audience, you may raise the level of your voice, uh, but don't shout at people. Talk to them. Converse with them. And so I have used, to the greatest extent possible, the conversational tone ever since, and I think it's particularly suited for television. 